Hello everyone and welcome back to Rocket Science with Space Plane Concept Testing. That's right, this time we are going to bring our Shinkansen Space Plane into Kerbal Space Program and see if the basic concept of having two of these belly to belly launching and uh, one of them getting to orbit would actually work before we proceed to refine the other numbers. So we have some basic numbers that we're working with like what the maximum mass of this is supposed to be and what general kinds of engines we expect to have in the tail and of course the fact that the the carrier plane has uh, additional t uh, tank in front so we can see there's a tank up here and then the other tanks in the back that the space plane one has so we'll call it the carrier plane and the space plane plane um, the space plane only has these in the back the carrier has these uh, uh, this one and uh, this feeds into a whole other discussion about my future plans this was originally supposed to be able to carry, I mean, it's already sort of failed in my original design intent. My original design intent was to have a payload bay and also to be able to carry that little lander stage inside. And I was hoping that it'd be able to carry the lander stage over to the moon, but um, it does not seem to be able to do that. Uh, it would need a payload capacity of at least uh, well, you know, we don't have to uh, carry the lander stage fueled over to the moon. It'd have to have a payload capacity of maybe uh, of the dry mass of the lander stage plus its payload, maybe four tons. So, yeah, um, we're not being we're not able to do f fulfill that function that I envisioned for it. But uh, we'll see what we can get away with. And uh, a lot of people had a lot of uh, suggestions for this, and. One of them was no windows. I'm afraid we're not going to be able to go get away with no windows. Spaceflight is stressful. Astronauts have been unanimous, mostly, uh, in being thankful for windows. And we are, at this point, mainly going to be carrying passengers, which means spaceflight tourists. And, of course, they're going to want windows. Now, our windows don't have to be as big as the space shuttle windows. Those were 700 kilograms. Um, our overall diameter is much less and the actual window area is much less. I estimate that these are actually 300 kilograms using the same materials as the space shuttle. So it's not that bad. But uh, if this is a, uh, a passenger liner, we might need extra windows on, on the side as well. Um, so yeah, windows are important. Uh, it's a sort of engineering conceit to just throw away the windows, but uh, you'll notice that that idea never has successfully flown. Uh, people don't put up with that very easily. Uh, another suggestion, using Skylon as a carrier plane. That isn't feasible uh, because this is 132 tons, uh, the space plane part, and Skylon's payload capacity is 17 tons. I don't think Skylon can carry something 132 tons on its back and lift off of a runway, even if you underfuel it by 115 tons, which would be what would be necessary for it to get off the ground, the aerodynamics would be horrid. And as you'll see, we're launching uh, this system vertically. So we're sort of skipping over that issue of launching horizontally. And yeah, I, I, uh, working out the aerodynamics of this plus Skylon is uh, an additional pain. Uh, working out this thing's aerodynamics all on its own is bad enough. But yeah, I don't think structurally Skylon can carry something this heavy on its back like that. It's not meant to. It'd have to be specially retrofitted for that. Um, okay, so as far as using oops, using um, air-breathing engines on the carrier plane, uh, I think that'll be too heavy. I thought about uh, looking into a methane-burning jet, actually, because we're using methane already. Uh, in place of the OMS system, because uh, here we have the OMS system, right? Uh, uh, the tanks on this side here. Uh, where we seem to be missing a tank. Uh, why, uh, that one's invisible. There we go. Okay, these two tanks here. We could put a jet engine right there, and uh, uh, one on the other side, obviously, and that could take the place of the OMS system. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's an additional complexity. And one of the nice things about this system is uh, we are basically using the same structure. So I, I want to make sure that doesn't change. But I'll think about it. You know, it's, a, it's a conceivable thing. Not for takeoff, obviously, but to assist in landing if that turns out to be necessary. Uh, takeoff, again, is vertical. So 
we're not going to be looking for air breathing much. Um, the leading edge I'll work on, uh, I have the resources people gave me, including uh, the hypersonic and high temperature gas dynamics by John D. Anderson Jr. And so I'll look through that 700 page book and, and learn about hypersonics. I know about supersonics, so you don't have to tell me about the area rule. I, I got that. And uh, so I've tapered up the back end here, but there's a limit to how much I can do that. And we have to uh, keep in mind the aerodynamic surfaces I'm going to add. But yeah, so I know about the area rule. Otherwise, I wouldn't have designed it like this. And uh, why do we want to limit transonic drag was a question. Uh, that, you'll see that while we're going up. <laughs> you'll see that. Uh, the, it's going to face a lot of drag as it is. And we want to limit that as much as possible. So, yeah, even though we're basically wanting drag coming back down, and that's one of the tricks with uh, looking up hypersonic resources. I don't know much about hypersonic speeds. Uh, supersonic, I'm much more familiar with. But uh, hypersonic speeds, a lot of time when I look up stuff on it, uh, the stuff is all on scramjets. And scramjets have a totally different design philosophy than uh, space planes. Uh, scramjets, you want to reduce the drag, and everything is sort of built around the engine. Uh, it's an integrated structure, you know, and, you know, basically the structure of the scramjet is trying to feed stuff into the engine. It's a very deliberate structure that isn't going on here. So we need a very different structure. Also, a lot of resources for hypersonics have to do with capsules coming back. And that's also not exactly what we're doing. So we have a delicate balance between seeking the to minimize drag in certain situations and maximizing drag in other situations. So, but I'll take a look at that book and hopefully you'll cover that. Thylo Root suggested using the Esterline EV4000 quintuple redundant avionics computer, and that does look like a good choice. So our computer system, I'm gonna estimate our avionics computer as 9.8 kilograms, which is quite good. So we've got a good computer there with documentation. Um, someone suggested ANSYS software uh, for combustion analysis, and I'm currently looking at uh, that and looking through videos to figure out how to use it for that. And hopefully I'll get to apply it to some degree when we design the engines for this, the methane burning engines that are needed for this. Um, I'm also uh, spending a lot more time on combustion chamber design. With the ED-1 lander, I cheated a little, I mean, we assumed radiation cooling really, which is when you pick a material that is has sufficient temperature tolerance to just deal with the heat, right? It'll just radiate the heat off and uh, it won't melt while the combustion is occurring. But seriously speaking, if we wanted to reuse that engine, that's not sufficient. And I, I give gave lip service to sending fuel around the combustion chamber in order to cool it, but I didn't really calculate that out. So uh, for the engines here, we are going to have to calculate that out because radiation cooling is not going to be sufficient for these. Though you'll see very visibly once we get into Kerbal Space Program why it sort of works for the OMS engines. So uh, that's another good thing about uh, Kerbal Space Program. You're going to see a lot of things visually that you can't get just with a model like this. Uh, Justin V uh, shared the space mission analysis and design, and that is a good reference, especially for the structural stuff in it. So I'm going to check whether I made any mistakes as far as the, the frames and stringers first, and then I'll use it for other things. Um, I wish it had more like example problems, but I figure that book will be like thousands of pages long if it did. So anyway, so those are the things that I noticed in the comments as far as this is concerned. Uh, let's just go ahead and look at Kerbal Space Program. Okay, so here we are, and let's take a look at our shuttle body and check out. So this is just the shuttle structure without the tanks. There's 15 tons, 15.41 tons. We don't have the cabin in yet, and the center of mass is back here. Um, and how did I get that? Actually, back to Blender. Uh, let's talk about how to get the center of mass in a way. So for each of the meshes, what the, unfortunately, uh, you might remember the tool we had to estimate the surface area, but and it has a surface area here of 821 uh, meters squared. 
but unfortunately just highlighting oh and we should probably do this in wireframe so we get the bottom surfaces uh, just highlighting all this let's say I wanted to see how much that surface area was right I don't know if it's got everything uh, let's go to circle tool to select and um, if I press area again it, it doesn't just get that area it still gets the area for the entire mesh so what I want to do is separate this off temporarily as another part and now what's the area of this part 446 so if we do the math it was 821 originally and now it's 446 so what we took off was about 380 now that's pretty close to being halfway and we're assuming because we're using the same material throughout that um, that we can use the area uh, surface area as a proxy for the center mass that's not entirely true um, because of the heat shielding being distributed a little bit differently there's actually a little bit more heat shielding up front because of the nose and uh, uh, of course the heavier tiles along the leading edge there that I mean when, when you balance it all out the heavier tiles on the leading edge might actually balance out the stuff on the nose Otherwise, the stuff on the bottom surface is evenly distributed. But um, yeah, so if we undo that, okay, and then instead of just separating off the part that we did before, now we get an area of 400 for this back portion. And so the four portion is 421. And so as far as our little estimate is concerned, the center of mass should be around here-ish. Uh, right because now we've got less than half in the back here now there is the matter of all the structural frames and stringers but we're assuming that goes along with the body and that's why it's here uh, I did that manually otherwise the center of mass would be here because that's where the zero 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 point is for the model uh, basically when by default the center of mass is always going to be at the zero point for the model the origin point uh, all right and if we take a look at this doesn't have any control surfaces we can take a look at far and uh, let's use uh, this these stability derivatives well obviously it's crappy <laughs> I mean obviously there's serious problems so let me bring out the version with the control surfaces that I've already got prepared okay this has control surfaces it also has the tanks so the way I did the tanks was um, well I guess I could just pull them out uh, they're a separate piece and right now they've got the engines and vertical stabilizers so we, we had to add additional vertical stabilizers I sort of expected that anyway uh, the reason I didn't model them in blender in the first place was because I wanted to see how big they needed to be and we might need to make these outer ones bigger that might be more helpful than having these center ones so I'll have to see uh, but uh, yeah you can see I put a node up there for this to attach to so we hold that down alt and attach and then there we go uh, it makes accessing the fuel tanks a little bit more complicated but not that complicated right now we're at 150 tons it says and that's partly because when I did the calculations and got 132 tons for the fuel mass of the space plane I didn't include the OMS tanks now we have to include the OMS tanks I haven't put the OMS engines here but we do have them and we'll have them in the VAB. Uh, I haven't made the engines yet. What I'm using here are Merlin 1D models, which are about the same thrust. And I'm using a Velociraptor configuration. <laughs> and uh, so this was a hypothetical engine burning methane and oxygen with the same thrust as the Merlin 1D. And here we have Velocir Velociraptor vacuum, 108 nozzle ratio. But there's a trick. Um, for, because we're going to have to light these engines on the surface as well, otherwise the thing will just flip over. Um, we need to have a good surface ISP and no flow separation, right? So on the real engines, we are going to need to have extendable nozzles. And uh, so like the RL10B2. So we'll have the nozzle extension retracted until it gets to a high altitude, about 20 kilometers. And then the nozzle extension will extend. So until uh, on at the surface, it's operating with, as the Velociraptor 24 with a nozzle ratio of 24. And then once we get to 20 kilometers, nozzle extension will extend and it'll operate as 
uh, a nozzle ratio of 108. So if we change to the Velociraptor 24, we'll see it has 301 sea level, 347 vacuum only. I used um, RPA light and that's what I was able to get uh, with a chamber pressure of 1500 PSI. So we're still gas generator. We're still operating on gas generator pressures uh, right at the top end too. Uh, we're not doing stage combustion as the Velociraptor probably would do stage combustion, but it's just hypothetical anyway. I'm going to use gas generator. And uh, so Velociraptor 24, and the reason I'm using gas generator is because it's easier to reuse it. Um, Velociraptor vacuum 108 uh, has the 372, but it's still assuming that we're at 24 at sea level. Okay, and you can see that uh, it has uh, 809 kilonewton sea level max thrust. Um, this is uh, 78. It really should be the same sea level max thrust for both of them. I'll have to tune that. Um, so probably we'll have to back down on the max thrust here because that's the number you input. I input the 1000 here and I input the 900 here. Okay, but uh, those are the engines we've got right now. And there's also a node up front uh, here. You can see the little green dot there. And that's for attaching the carrier tank, right? Because that's also a thing. So when we take a look at the center mass, you can see it's moved very far back because of the tanks back here. And if we empty the tanks, it'll move further forward. Now it's further back than it ought to be because we don't have the cabin in yet. And uh, let's see, what's the dry mass of this whole thing without any fuel? It says 29 tons. Part of that is our additional controls, uh, additional surfaces, not control surfaces, but the vertical stabilizer here and all these control surfaces. Uh, we can see it's uh, rating this as 0.8 tons. This is also 0.8 tons. They're 0.8 tons each. And this is the actual rudder is 0.188 tons. We're going to have to review whether that's actually how heavy they need to be. Um, probably the rudder, yes, but the vertical stabilizer We'll have to check and compare to the surface area of the shuttle's vertical stabilizer. I think that can be lighter. So, but we'll go with this and get some margin on the whole idea before we proceed. There's so many uncertainties, like we haven't put it in the cabin yet. And uh, so, if we wanted to turn this into the carrier plane, let me uh, see, where is my carrier plane tank? There it is. So this is the carrier craft tank, 20 meters, like I said in the previous video. And we attach that like that. And then they'll have it inside uh, in place of everything else. And it is 3.67 meter diameter. Now I started to talk about uh, different ideas that uh, I had that this is part of, right? Again, it was supposed to carry that ED-1 lander stage inside of it. Um, and then the ED-1 lander stage. So it would take the ED-1 lander stage over to uh, the moon. The ED-1 lander could land on the moon and then operate uh, on a reusable basis there. And then this would bring it back home after it's all done. But, uh, and of course, this would also be carrying the passengers for everything. But obviously the numbers aren't working out that great. But another idea is uh, this tank and the engines that go along with it uh, could be used as a launch stage, right? This, this looks like a first stage of a launch vehicle. And in fact, uh, these tanks here, those could be the second stage of a launch vehicle, just one of them obviously, just this one here would be the second stage of a methane oxygen launch vehicle. And uh, the basic idea here is that we're going to be use, reusing as many parts in as it's got to be economy of scale. We're going to be producing the same parts for multiple systems, which is why our OMS system here is going to use the same tanks and the same engines as the ED-1 lander. But uh, so yeah, it's a sort of an integrated system as far as manufacturing is concerned. Something that hasn't really been done that much. I mean, they've tried a little bit in the real space program, but because the contracts are often given all over the place, uh, right? I mean, even on the Apollo system, you had the command module built by one person, one uh, team uh, that was uh, North American, and you had the lunar lander uh, being built by Grumman, 
And of course, the CO2 systems didn't mesh together, as we learned in Apollo 13. Uh, so, yeah, you, the whole the whole way it's been going so far doesn't hasn't really allowed economy of scale very well. So, data and stability derivatives calculate. Well, Mach number 0.35. Well, okay. First of all, um, we are not going to be trying to fly this thing fully fueled. We know. Uh, our, even our landing gear can't take landing with all the fuel in, so we're gonna assume one-tenth of the fuel. That seems reasonable as a limit. Okay, well, here we have the rudder problem, uh, the vertical stabilization problem. See, this is a change in yaw right angular acceleration with respect to side slip angle, and this is a thing that you very often see with planes uh, when you're trying to design them, in that uh, you start slipping off to the side. Uh, when you're trying to yaw, you basically uh, yawing gets to be a slippery slope, right? Uh, uh, it's, it goes out of bounds. It's not. Uh, it doesn't return. Basically, for all the um, airplane dynamics, you want it to like return to a neutral situation. Now, this uh, the space shuttle was not uh, stabilized like that. It was actually actively stabilized with the fly-by wire system. But um, uh, we're gonna try our best because we don't really have sophisticated stabilization systems, computerized stabilization systems on this. And you know, those things can get pretty heavy, I guess. But actually not, but uh, on the space shuttle they sure seem to be. This is annoying as well. A uh, change in pitch up angular acceleration with respect to Z direction of velocity should be negative, it is positive. So again, that's going out of bounds. And that's got to cause flippiness. Basically, any red thing in here has got to cause flippiness if you want to get it basically. What these derivatives are are the change in one thing with respect to this change in another thing. When you change one variable, how does another variable change? Just make it all green. <laughs> I, I'm not going to go through all this, but uh, there are a few things we can go over. When you change the Mach number, this is just the airspeed based on that Mach number, so same airspeed. Well, not the same airspeed because you'll notice if you change the altitude, that'll change. Um, right, because the Mach number changes based on altitude. Um, when you see zero angle of attack, I, I don't think it's being honest about that. Uh, what it really means is that there's actually no angle of attack that you're going to get lift. This is the angle of attack it needs to maintain in order to have lift. So if we change this to Mach 1, uh, this means that at Mach 1, this thing needs to pitch up by 5 degrees to maintain level flight, which is pretty harsh, pretty harsh. And it makes you wonder whether it's calculating these wings properly. It does at least give us some lift. And in fact, if we opened up the base model, let's let's uh, just look at the body for a sec instead of this whole thing. Let's check that that gets some lift. Okay, so does this have lift? Well, it says at Mach 1, 5 degrees still. Reference area is only 39 meters squared. Um, how about Mach 2? 2.9. So it is calculating it, and it seems like this is the main supplier of lift. Because the angle attack right now, let's let's use uh, 5 kilometers Mach 1 as a reference. Uh, 5.17, and if we open up the other one with the, with the control surfaces. Hmm. Uh, and we calculate stability derivatives. What the heck? Now it says angle of attack 15. Number, Wait. Uh, oh, I know. The, uh, this is why I'm confused. We didn't reduce the propellant. Okay, back to the original thing. So always remember, I reloaded the model, but I didn't reduce the propellant. Okay, now that makes sense. All right, angle of attack 5.23. So again, we're getting most of the the lift from the body alone. That makes sense. And it's not the control surfaces that are adding lift. And the reason why this angle attack is higher, which means that the lift is worse, is because we've added mass. We've added a lot of mass with these, uh, so and the engines as well. So there's that. Now, if I uh, go to a higher altitude, that gets better. And if we get to 15 kilometers and Mach 1.5, that's okay, but this is not the best situation, obviously. We've got a lot of work to do on the aerodynamics of this, including, you know, figuring out the thermal situation for the leading edge and everything. But uh, for now, we'll take a look at how this works 
in practical flight in the VAB. Now it's possible that there is some issue with the way FAR is reading the aerodynamics of it, uh, depending on how it's calculating the body shape and whether the origin point is affecting it somehow. But anyway, this is what we've got. Now uh, we'll start with uh, this topic. Uh, th th this isn't the ca uh, color I really wanted the ED-1 lander engines to be, but here we are. Um, ED-1 lander engines. They're huge, aren't they? Look at that. Compared to the Merlin 1D. And that's why using the radiative cooling works, because they're just... Uh, they have a lot more surface area compared to the amount of combustion they're doing. So there's all these little, well, you can imagine, there's 30 kilonewtons worth of particles bouncing around in the combustion chamber. And, but there's so much more surface area for them to heat that it's easier for it to radiate out the heat than, say, the Merlin engine, where there's nearly a thousand kilonewtons going through there and a lot less surface area. Now, the combustion chamber you can see here on the Merlin engine is actually much larger. See, the combustion chamber here is smaller, this one's larger. But because this is a low-pressure engine, it's still proportionately a larger combustion chamber compared to the repellents going through. And, of course, the nozzle is much bigger because it's a vacuum-optimized nozzle. Okay, and, of course, uh, if we had the Merlin vacuum engine, that would obviously look a lot bigger. And we'll have to think about that. But one good thing about the retractable nozzles is that if we retract them back again, we don't need a whole lot of shielding for those, right? Uh, we don't have to have a huge body flap to, in addition to what we've got right now. Uh, so we can assume that the nozzle is roughly this size, and then the extendable nozzle will extend beyond that, but uh, we'll retract again for re-entry. Now, I haven't figured out the RCS system on the Shinkansen, so I've just slapped on RCS pods. These are from RW, uh, sorry, KW Rocketry and they're my favorite little RCS pods. <laughs> um, they're just very nice, and they're supposed to be shielded. And I've got a Methylox configuration for them, and they have an ISP of 350. So that's them. And otherwise, this side is the carrier plane side, and it has five of the surface variant of the Velociraptor, and tilted a little bit. Now that's a trick. We're going to have to carefully manage the launch because as this empties of fuel, and it's actually cross-feeding fuel into the space plane side, and that's, that's another system that we're going to have to work on. I don't know exactly how heavy that's supposed to be, but on the bright side, we are overestimating the mass of the carrier plane because, remember, it was supposed to be lighter than the space plane, but right now it isn't. Right now it's just got the same structural mass with all the heat shielding. And uh, it's also got the OMS tanks in the back. So yeah, uh, we're overestimating ma estimating the mass of the carrier plane, and hopefully that'll counterbalance what additional masses we have to add. So it's also 20 odd tons uh, when you calculate the full structural mass. If we take a look right now, it reads the empty mass of the space plane as 23 tons out of a possible, we calculated, 24 tons. And that's why we have the delta V we do. We have 1,068 meters per second. But yeah, it's really hard when, once this empties for these engines to continue pointing through the center of mass because most of the mass of the space plane will still be back here because it hasn't burned any of its fuel, right? So its center of mass is back here. And progressively, it's got to get harder and harder for these engines to work with that. And we've got to turn them off. We, there's no, no option otherwise. We've got to progressively turn them off. So I've action grouped that. We've also uh, got engine group controller working. So if you right click here with realism overhaul, there is an option assign group ID. And you can see engine group ID is carrier. And so I can throw those engines separately from the engines on the space plane. All right, well, with those thoughts in, let's bring it outside and see what happens. Okay, well, here they are. And this guy complicated. 
It uh, is a little bit smoother if I use KOS, but I haven't gotten the KOS script together for this yet. And there's a lot of complications to flying this. So uh, we'll use Smart ASS, but as a result, it's going to sort of skew on launch a little bit because Smart ASS isn't as good as uh, KOS at dealing with that. For those who don't know, KOS is a scripting language for, for Kerbal Space Program. Anyway, um, everything else looks okay. And so we're actually carrying food, water, and oxygen on both sides. Um, in total, uh, it doesn't say, but uh, in total we're carrying like uh, 28 days of food, water, and oxygen for four people. Uh, but yeah, that's something we need to dump in the carrier plane in the future. But ignition. And I'm gonna execute that and launch. So yeah, um, this sort of deviance is to be expected at this point. You can see our vessel mass. Altogether, this mass on the launch pad is less than that of a Falcon 9. And when you think about it, that makes sense. Because the Falcon 9's maximum mass to orbit in expendable mode is 22.8 tons. Basically, that's the same as the structural mass, the empty mass of the space plane. Uh, and we're using all of our fuel, right? We are actually, we're not reserving any fuel for landing. But these engines are more efficient than the engines on the Falcon 9. That's kerosene and oxygen. This is methane and oxygen. So when you think about it that way, it, it actually makes sense that this would be lighter. Now, part of the wiggling is the complications of having those control surfaces. Part of it is just the sheer drag on this. Let's bring out the engine group controller. Now the shuttle actually did use its control surfaces to relieve stress in the vehicle. The computers handled that obviously. So I'm gonna throttle them down to about there. Now that throttle range isn't the actual throttle range, they only throttle down to 20%. So analogous to a Merlin 1D. So I'm going to hold it steady at 45 degrees and see what that does. And I'm getting ready to turn off the outer engines on the carrier. And there'll be a wobble as uh, when that happens. KOS wouldn't wobble, but this will. As we change the thrust on the carrier plane. Now, initially I thought that we could launch out of Brownsville and then have the carrier plane land at Cape Canaveral. I don't think it's got that kind of range when we separate from it. Oop, we need to... Uh, okay, bring that up a bit. Yeah, I think it's more like if we... If we launch out of Vandenberg westward, it could land at Edwards or Nellis kind of thing. It's more like an X-15 situation than, uh, than being able to cross the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, let's throw that all the way down, point a little bit better, and get ready to separate. Separate. Okay, there goes the carrier plane. We'll have to work on decoupling. Having it do a black backflip is probably not the best thing. Obviously, it would need RCS thrusters as well. And as you can see, we now have about 6,400 meters per second left, enough to get to orbit. But we we still have to be careful about this. Now, the nice thing about this design is the engines, the main engines, are going through the center of mass, and you know they don't require the external tank attached to operate. And that's important because we want to be able to relight them in order to do our translunar injection, right? This wants to go over to the moon, and it's not going to use the OMS engines for that purpose. It would take too long to burn the OMS engines. They would probably uh, be seriously damaged by that long burn. We'll turn RCS on just in case it needs some help. Uh, unfortunately, the decoupler part got uh, permanently attached to this. Uh, we'll ignore that for now. 
So if we take a look at where our carrier plane ends up, that's at the Bree piece, I think. Or maybe not. Oh no, that's there, there. It's ending up here. If we had a runway in like Bermuda or something, maybe, maybe it could glide over there. As we get into space, I'll very carefully try and roll over. We need to throttle down now too. Okay, we are in space. I'm gonna try and roll it. Um, we have to start at 180, which is what it's at right now. If I try and uh, go straight to zero, it's going to cause serious issues. In fact, even as I slowly roll it, you can see it wiggle quite a lot. Smart ASS doesn't like rolling. Lots of stuff in Kerbal Space Program do not like roll. I think I might have wanted to do this some other time. We're about to make orbit. Um, and it's got to be a lopsided orbit, unfortunately because I was busy doing that instead. Uh, come on, 140. All right. <laughs> All right, we have a pretty wonky orbit. 140 by 855-ish. And it's rolling. Hey, uh, you can use the RCS, you know. It's going to take a little while. The RCS is a little bit underpowered for this right now. I have to properly configure an RCS system and place the thrusters in the right locations, really. Uh, but uh, yeah, we can see 27 tons right now, 580 meters per second, depending on how what direction the engines are gibbling. Uh, let's shut these down. We could have used the OMS system to help stabilization during the, the roll, the roll portion of it. Okay, it's only 559 with the OMS because those engines are actually less efficient than the main engines. Again, pressure fed does take a knock out of it. They're only 360 in vacuum. The main engines are 372. And again, those numbers are just from RPA light, so. Okay, well, I guess it's our solemn duty to try and bring this back down again. Uh, let's bring the apoapsis down a bit. We don't need to go from that particular height. But we pretty much know that this is not going to be stable coming down. It's just a matter of when it flips, right? Okay, so we're going up. Um, I think we should pitch down a bit. I want to keep the periapsis right now. I guess it doesn't really matter though. We are well under that 10% mark, by the way, as far as our fuel remaining. So, really what we want to do is reduce it to less than 5% even, to represent how much we would be coming back down with. Right now, we've only got, what, maybe 3% of the fuel? I might need to move the OMS engines a little bit higher. Might actually want to switch places between the, them and the main engines, but but the main engines direct are like directly behind the main tanks right now, which is sort of a nice configuration. I feel like that's probably better off. And of course, the OMS engines directly behind the OMS tanks. Well, not directly behind. They're actually a little bit off to the side because I sort of tightened up the tail. So the pur purpose of this test is to tell us something about this. Maybe we need to add masses like for the vertical stabilizers and all. So we need to think about that. Maybe think about redesigning these outer edge. I don't know what you want to call them. I I'll call them vertical stabilizers as well. So the outer edge vertical stabilizers. Might want to rethink those. Interestingly, I, I sort of tweaked the rotation on the vertical stabilizers so that they would be optimal for FAR. And more or less, they're parallel to these outer ones. They're just a little bit off. I don't know why that seemed optimal, but that's what it was. We can Really, what's going to happen is probably the pitch. I, I don't think the yaw is going to be a big problem initially. Yaw gets to be a problem around 40 to 50 kilometers. 
I mean, it is wiggling a little bit, but that's because I've got, uh, you know, I'll take it out of physical time war for now. Um, pitch is the first problem. And then later on, if you get through the possible pitch issues, then yaw becomes a problem. And I'm just concerned that we really don't have that much pitch authority on here. Not, not because of the control surfaces, even though I'm looking at them suspiciously. But I don't, I don't think the RCS system is sufficient either. And uh, what you really want is not to be using either. What you really want is the center of mass and center of lift to be really, really close to each other so that it can pivot easier. Uh, but And that's how it is with the shuttle. The shuttle uh, allowed range for the center of mass is within one meter. So I've got a little diagram of uh, where, where it's allowed to be for the shuttle. Oh, we've got a problem. Uh, it's actually not able to push the nose down. That wasn't the way I thought it would go. But yeah, so it nosed up and pretty quickly too. We're still above 90 kilometers. There's not that much air here. So our center of lift and center mass are really far apart. And that's not doing anything good. Well, now we have to check whether the model has reasonable thermodynamics on it. Uh, because that's just sort of written into the configuration files on in Kerbal Space Program. In other words, this should explode, right? Um, for our future, you know, testing, we need to make sure that this does actually explode. But this is actually very interesting to see in terms of... I, for a while, they thought about putting sort of wingtip roll thrusters for the shuttle. Obviously, that would have been too complicated, but for a lifting body, that's more feasible. And so maybe uh, wingtip roll thrusters would be a good idea. Oh. Well, it all went poof. And at 82 kilometers, so that's pretty quick. So it's safe to say that... Uh, in terms of our thermal system, it's going to definitely punish us, which is good. So we want that. All right. Well, we've got a lot of work to do, but this is the situation right now. And uh, I'm going to look through all the resources that I've gotten. It's got to take me a while to digest all the hypersonic stuff and uh, analyze my structural situation with um, space mission analysis and design. So I'll see what I can present to you as an update uh, later on in the next video. But for now, I think we've got some satisfactory progress here. And with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.